All right. Mr. Marlboro, call your next witness. Your Honor, the government calls Mr. Keith McCain. Mr. McCain, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you are about to give in the cause before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Keith McCain, plaintiff's witness, sworn. Please state your name for the record. Keith McCain. Good morning, Mr. McCain. How are you doing? Let me ask you first, are you incarcerated right now? Yes, I am. Mr. McCain, it's very hard to hear in this courtroom. You're going to have to talk right into that microphone. Yes, I am. And Mr. McCain, that microphone can move, so you can feel free to move it closer to you if that helps. How long have you been in prison for? 24 years. And what were the charges that initially got you locked up? 848 CCE. Is that a drug-related offense? Yes, it is. And the offense you were convicted of, was that gang-related in any way? Yes, it was. Was it a particular gang that you were a part of? Gangster Disciples. In the 24 years you've been incarcerated, Mr. McCain, have there been times where you stayed active with the Gangster Disciples? Objection. This is constant leading. Overruled. You can answer, Mr. McCain. Yes. And do those include times as recent as the past few years? Objection. Leading. Try not to lead your witness, Mr. Mulroy. How recently has the contact and your participation in the gang continued, Mr. McCain? The last four years. So it's been fairly recent? Yes. Mr. McCain, I'm going to ask you some questions about the history of the gang as you've lived it, but I want to first ask you some questions about your personal history. So what year were you born, Mr. McCain? 1967. That makes you how old now? 52. And where did you grow up? Chicago, Illinois. Was it a particular part of Chicago you're from? East side of Chicago, 79th and between Stony Cottage Grove. The neighborhood was called Lawn City. Lawn City, that's L-O-N City? Yes, sir. And that's the neighborhood you grew up in? Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about your family situation growing up. Objection, Your Honor. Irrelevant. Overruled. My mother died when I was eight, so I went to go stay with an aunt. And I'll ask you, your aunt, was she also in Lawn City? Yes, she was. And did you live with cousins, sisters, brothers? Well, they were my cousins, Ma and her kids. Was that a pretty stable, happy household for you? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Overruled. You know, as an eight-year-old growing up and not having no mother, you used to be used to seeing a mother, not not seeing your mother, who died on you. So it was kind of, you know, it was, as an eight-year-old at the time, it was tough readjusting somewhere. Now, in Lawn City at that time, were gangs active in your neighborhood? Yes, they were. Were there any gangs that were especially active in Lawn City? Gangster Disciples. When did you first become aware that the Gangster Disciples were in your neighborhood? Well, I joined a gang when I was 11. So you actually joined the gang as a youngster? Yes, sir. Tell us how that came about. Well, just, you know, starting out just being something that the kids do in the neighborhood. Everybody just, everybody get along. And that's what the neighborhood was at that time. That's all it ever been. So, you know, just being kids, we at the time called ourselves disciples. Was there anything about the gangster disciples that was especially attractive to you as an 11-year-old? I mean, objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Overruled. You see the lifestyle, you know. You see the things that, that most kids your age couldn't have. You see certain individuals that was in the gang that was having certain material, material things and, you know, those things that you kind of wanted, the things that they had that you couldn't get at that time. Now, for an 11 year old boy who wants to join the Gangster Disciples, what were the steps or the process that you had to go through? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Overruled. 
well, really, it was just, we didn't have to get jumped in or nothing like that. It was just that the God that ran the neighborhood liked you, he would bless you in. You know, he would pretty much tell everybody at that time that he was with us. You know what I mean? So the guy who ran the neighborhood, did he like you? I mean, pretty much. I mean, objection, speculation, overruled. I was real. How can I say? I ain't going to say disturbed as a child, but I was, like I say, going through transition of growing up and not having a mother. Seeing other kids with their parents and things like that kind of made me bitter as a youngin. You know what I mean? So it kind of made me more wild, as you would say. I guess you can use that term. I was more wild and more just mad at the world, I guess you could say. I was mad at the world. So it was, you know, when you're young and you be mad and wild, you do things, I guess, that other ordinary kids wouldn't do. So you acted out a bit. Am I hearing you? Correct. Objection. Leading. Overruled. That's correct. And did that make you a better candidate for the gang or a worse candidate? Objection. Speculation. Overruled. Well, I think what makes you a good or bad candidate with the organization is pretty much what can you do to help them. So when you joined as an 11-year-old, was the gang very structured or organized at that time in your neighborhood? No, it really wasn't structured that much like that. Just had a guy like ran the neighborhood and whatever he pretty much said, that's pretty much all you had. In my neighborhood, you had different fraction of the gangs that was in my neighborhood. So you had two different fractions. They both was GD at the time. But, you know, you had, like, I guess you would say groups. Like, in my neighborhood, we had, like, Black Gangster Disciples and we had High Supreme Gangster Disciples. You know what I mean? So then was two fractions that you had in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? It was kind of like, well, not kind of like, they was like beefing with each other. You know what I'm saying? So there was no structure. It was disorganized? Yeah, pretty much so. Were there leaders or authority figures in the gang that you knew about that were bigger than or above the BOS of the neighborhood? Yeah, Gregory Shells. He was in jail for murder, and he was pretty much calling the streets, you know, telling the guy that ran the neighborhood pretty much what to do as far as the black gangster disciples. You know what I mean? So he was pretty much just calling the shots from the jail. Gregory Shells. Did he have a nickname? Shorty G. So all you in the neighborhood knew who he was? Correct. What about above Shells or Shorty G? Was there anyone even more important than him? Well, everybody knew that Mr. Hoover, Larry Hoover, was the chairman of the organization. What does it mean to be the chairman of the Gangster Disciples? Street terms you call the king, the boss, the one that's the overall leader of the gang. And was he someone that you would see in the neighborhood? No, he was in jail. He was in jail like Shorty G? Correct. You told us a moment ago that it was not very organized when you first joined. Did there ever come a time when that changed? Yeah, probably like about Gregory Shells got out of jail. Shorty G got out of jail. When he got out of jail, he pretty much got everybody together and told everybody, you know, this direction that we was going in, and everybody pretty much fell in line, pretty much. Can you remember roughly what year that was? It may be. It might have been between 82 and 86, somewhere around there. Maybe somewhere up in there. About how old were you? I was probably like 16, about 16. So you had been in the gang a few years at this point, correct? And what exactly was the message that he brought when he got out of jail? That it wasn't going to be any more fractions of the organization. Your Honor, I would object to all of this as hearsay. This has not been connected with any of the acts in our indictment or the acts that the evidence has been put in about. No speech is misdone. The hearsay objection is overruled. And confrontation clause because I can't cross-examine this person who's talking outside of court. When I overrule an objection, Miss Dunn, that doesn't mean you make another objection. You make all your objections at one time. I was trying. It's overruled. Go ahead, Mr. Mulrow. You were about to tell us about the changes that Shorty G brought when he got out of jail. Why don't you start over? 
he just pretty much got both fractions together, the Black Gangster Disciples and the High Supreme Gangster Disciples, and got us together and told us that Mr. Hoover said there wasn't any more fractions of the organization, just going to be called one organization. That was the Gangster Disciples. So kind of unifying the whole thing? Correct. Apart from unifying the gang, were there any other changes that Shorty G brought at that time? Well, at the time, he had a guy named Robert Lee that was pretty much calling the shots for the neighborhood, and he changed him over time. Gave him to a guy named Dart. Made a leadership change? Correct. And when someone held a leadership position in the gang, were there any titles that went along with that? Well, before it wasn't. It was just known as leaders. But when he came out, he said he was bringing structure to the organization. He appointed what you call the regent. That would be like a neighborhood BOS. So the neighborhood BOS was a regent? Correct. What about Shorty G himself? Did he have a title? Well, he was a governor. And these changes that Shorty G brought, do you know whether they were his idea or whether they came from somewhere else? Objection. Speculation. Overruled. Well, it came from Mr. Hoover. Larry Hoover? Correct. The chairman? Yes, sir. Now, with these leadership titles being handed out at that time, Mr. McCain, did you have any type of leadership position? What was your status in the game? Well, at that time, I didn't have any status at that time. At this time, you said you were a teenager. 16 or so? Yeah, around 16, somewhere around there. For you, as a teenager in the gang, did you have any feelings about this new unification and structure? Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. Overruled. Well, at that time, we was, like I said, it was two different fractions in that neighborhood, and and you had mentioned those two fractions before. Which was the fraction that you were a part of? Past Supreme Gangsters. Go ahead, I cut you off. Two fractions really wasn't getting along. They was... We was beefing at the time amongst each other. And when he came out, he said that Mr. Hoover said there wasn't no more fractions. And it was just going to be GD. You know, we was, Your Honor, I'm going to object to what Mr. Hoover said. I understand he is in prison at this time. So I would argue that that is speculation. Overruled, he can explain his conduct. Go ahead, Mr. McCain. Your Honor, if I can then get a limiting instruction that that testimony is not offered for the truth, but just to explain conduct. Ladies and gentlemen, a witness can testify to what he heard in order to explain his conduct. Go ahead, Mr. McCain. And, Your Honor, I would note also that I think we've established that Hoover was a member of the racketeering conspiracy, so this would be admissible under 801-D2E. That's right, too. Go ahead, Mr. McCain. We was young, and Gregory Shells come from the background of the Black Gangster Disciples. So, you know, when he came... Mr. Hoover said it was going to be one fraction. You know, as to the younger guys, we kind of bucked. You know, we didn't tell him per se to him to his face, but we pretty much let everybody know that we was bucking. We wasn't going to apply to that. 